Okay, we'll go ahead and get started now that everyone's here. Um, most of you know who I am. I'm a health coach over at Workplace Wellness, Katie Tam. I think I know all of you. I would imagine I know all of you by this point. So today we'll talk a lot about um, sleep, just the basics around it, um, some of the fundamental information, and then why it's important to us. And then we'll talk a lot about just effective sleep hygiene, sleep patterns. I'm gonna go back to this slide here on the statistics. So we spend about a third of our lives sleeping. Um, about a third of Americans report getting less than seven hours of sleep per night. I like read that and I don't believe that. I think it would be more. Like I feel like everybody I talk to does not get good sleep. So I was kind of surprised at that one. Um, I'm gonna skip around a little bit. Women have an increased risk of insomnia than men do, almost as high as 40%. Um, the last one there, kind of important for our industry, nurses working 12 and a half hour shifts report committing more than three times as many errors as someone working a normal eight and a half hour shift. Again, no surprise with that. Um, we do a lot of shift work as well, so I'm gonna get into shift work later, but um, just some quick statistics on sleep. But let's get into the actual education on it here. And like I said, I'm gonna be reading through some of my notes because there's a lot of information just on education with what it is. So sleep is just a period of rest that alternates with wakefulness. We do have internal body clocks that control when we're awake and when we're asleep. I'm going to get into that more because that's your circa circadian rhythm. And then the second half of this is once asleep, we cycle through stages of sleep throughout the night in a predictable pattern. So we will also hit on stages of sleep. So that first one, the circadian rhythms. So I mentioned it's a 24 hour cycle that's part of our body's internal clock. And um, this internal clock may be a little different for everybody. So some people may naturally stay up later. Some people may get up later um, or get up earlier. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that, but um, it will be a little different for everyone. But this rhythm pretty much coordinates and regulates every system in our body. So it has an effect on every cell, tissue, organ, that we have and how they work. Um, they're located throughout our body in different organs and then in our brain. So we'll focus on the master clock, obviously, because that the one in our brain is the one that deals with sleep. But when I was learning about this, I didn't realize that we had like rhythms in our digestive system. So it helps with producing proteins that help with the timing of our, or that are released during our typical timing of meals. I had no idea that that was even a thing. So the more you know. <laughs> but uh, this master clock is influenced by a lot of different things. I'm not going to hit on every single one of these, but I'll kind of talk about the first four there. So age, um, it is natural for a teenager to stay up late and wake up early or wake up late. Gosh dang it, I can't talk today. Um, which I feel like I remember being young and my mom always yelling at me because I was sleeping in, but that is perfectly <coughs> natural for a teenager to do. Um, as we get older though, we start to lose neurons that help with promoting sleep. So it's just a natural part of aging that um, those neurons are, we're losing them. So um, with that as well, certain health conditions as we age can play a part. So like Alzheimer's disease can help with, not help, speed up the loss of neurons as well. So um, that contributes to older adults getting less sleep um, waking up maybe more often and then they don't spend as much time in deep sleep. So age definitely plays a role in those rhythms in our body. So light, um, including artificial light, plays a big role. So light signals to our body and brain that it's time to be awake. Um, it helps with staying in tune with day and night. Artificial light can mess with this a little bit so we'll get into that more. But um, that cycle of light and dark helps with producing um, melatonin. So as it goes on throughout the day, melatonin is released as it gets dark outside. And um, it peaks in the early morning. Melatonin, I think most of you probably know at this point, it helps with promoting sleep. So if we are getting that artificial light at night, it can kind of stop that production. So it is very important to, you know, making sure we're watching artificial light. Again, we'll get into that a little bit later. And as we wake up, like sunrise will actually promote cortisol being released into your body. So again, the light, artificial light can play with introducing cortisol in the middle of the night. So that can be an issue down the line if you are doing a lot of bright lights at night. So TV, phone, 
computer screen, um, anything like that. Exercise, if we're not getting enough exercise, if we're not getting outside, those things can play a role with it. Caffeine. So with caffeine, um, our body has a biological need for sleep that increases as the day goes on and the longer we stay awake. So there's a compound that's released in our body that's linked to that need of sleep. Um, and if um, we start to, let me go, okay. If we start to introduce caffeine or even certain drugs, it can mess with that compound and stop it and block it from being released out into our body. That compound is adenosine. Um, so again, we have that biological need. Caffeine can mess with that if we're taking in large amounts of caffeine. And then temperature, health issues, shift work, social activity. I'm gonna get into these things kind of throughout the actual presentation. So um, I'm not gonna hit on those as much right now. Okay, so stages of sleep then. It's not uniform. And over the course of the night, our sleep is actually made up of several cycles of this, um, of each stage. So in a typical night, a person will go through four to six cycles of these four stages. Um, not all sleep cycles are the same length, um, but on average, they last about 90 minutes. This is where I got a little confused and had to reference my notes a lot. <laughs> um, so stage one, the first three stages are actually non-REM sleep stages. Um, the higher the number, the harder, like if you're in stage three, the harder it will be to wake you up. So stage one is essentially the dozing off stage. Um, it lasts one to five minutes. Our body hasn't fully relaxed yet. Um, our brain activities and body activities do start to slow a little bit, but we do have brief movements, AKA twitches that are happening at this point in time. Um, it's easy to wake someone up during this stage, but if you aren't interrupted, then you go to stage two pretty quickly in this, um, in this area. As the night goes on, if you're uninterrupted, you won't spend much time in this stage at all. Um, Stage two, your body's gonna start entering into a more subdued state. Your temperature's gonna drop, your muscles are gonna relax, your breathing and heart rate are gonna slow down, um, your eye movement stops, your brain activity slows down, but there are some short bursts of activity that can help with resisting being woken up by something external happening. This stage can last 10 to 25 minutes during the first sleep cycle, but then as each cycle progresses through the night, um, it's going to become longer. A person typically spends half of their sleep in this stage. Stage three is deep sleep. It's harder to wake someone up in this phase. Their muscle tone, their pulse, their breathing rate decreases. Your body relaxes even further. Um, the brain waves in this stage are called delta waves, so that's why it's saying other names up there. It could be slow wave sleep, delta sleep. Um, Experts believe that this stage is critical to restorative sleep, so it's going to help with like repairing your body, um, growth, it may help with in, um, improving your immune system. It can actually, um, or there has been some evidence that shows it can contribute to insightful thinking, memory, and creativity. Um, we spend most of our time in deep sleep during the first half of the night. But then um, as we continue sleeping, those stages get shorter and we're gonna spend more sleep in the REM stage, which is stage four. So just kind of a summary on the first three. This, these stages are responsible for you know, building bone and muscle, repairing stuff in your body, regenerating tissues, um, and helping with the immune system and can help maybe with memory, creativity, and um, I can't remember what the other one was. Something was thinking. Where'd I go? Insightful thinking. Um, <laughs> so stage four REM sleep, this is when your brain activity picks up. It's actually going to near levels of when you're awake, um, but at the same time, your body is actually going to experience some temporary paralysis with two exceptions. So your breathing and then your eyes. So your eyes are gonna be rapidly moving. That's where the name comes from, rapid eye movement. So um, this, is believe, this stage is believed to be essential for the memory, learning, and creativity. So while the other three stages have some evidence, this one for sure helps with those things. Um, dreams typically occur, vivid dreams typically occur during this stage. 
dreams can occur in the other three, but it's not as often and not as intense. Um, under normal circumstances, you don't normally enter this stage of sleep until about 90 minutes in. But as the night goes on, like I mentioned, this stage is going to be um, lasting longer. Um, the first stage may last only a couple minutes, but near the end, it's going to last around an hour. Um, and then this makes up for about 25% of sleep in adults. Um, and I mentioned age earlier. So when we're infants, we spend the most time in REM. And then as a adolescence, young adulthood, it declines and obviously it declines even more into old age. So why is this important? If we're not um, getting through these sleep stages very well or we're getting interrupted, then it's obviously going to have effects psychologically, physically, mentally. Well, and I'm, I'm going to get into those a little bit more, but that, I mean, that's why it's important. That's why we're talking about it. So, um, okay. Recommendation. It should really be seven to nine, but I put seven to eight on there because, like I said, most of us are probably getting on the lower end of that. There's very few people that I've talked to that are getting eight or nine hours of sleep, but, um, and if you are, then maybe you should be the one doing this presentation, but. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I had a baby eight months ago, so I'm definitely not sleeping. Um, <laughs> it's probably why I'm having issues reading some of these things to you guys. So, <laughs> common sleep disorders. This sleep disorders are definitely something you should take seriously. Um, you, if you think you have any of this, talk to your doctor because a lot of times treatment is going to include some type of medication or something that you can't just go to the store and buy. Um, so insomnia, the first one here, characterized by inability to initiate or maintain sleep, but also early morning waking in which you can't go back to bed. Um, it's, you're usually going to have excessive daytime sleepiness with this, um, but if you go see your healthcare provider, they usually are going to try to rule out any other um, problems. So it, if you're, you know, I think on here, I, medication, substance abuse, depression, um, any other undetected illnesses before they kind of uh, tackle it as insomnia. Sleep apnea is um, snoring, gasping, they actually even say snorting um, in the middle of your sleep that interrupts your sleep. So again, you may experience daytime sleepiness, excessive daytime sleepiness. This treatment depends on its cause. So it has been linked to other medical problems and um, like such as congestive heart failure, nasal obstruction. So your sleep apnea may resolve if you fix those things first. A CPAP machine would also be something that would be treatment for, for this. Restless leg syndrome. Um, this is characterized by unpleasant creeping, often feeling it in your lower legs, um, aches and pains throughout your legs. It's hard to initiate sleep and it's usually relieved by moving your legs such as walking or kicking. So um, again, this is something where a healthcare provider would probably have to prescribe you some type of medication to help with this. Narcolepsy. My husband go ahead. describes it as jumping. His, like he'll say, my legs are jumping. I gotta, I gotta go lay down. Mm. Interesting. I've never experienced it. I've heard a lot of people experiencing it. So, um, narcolepsy. So this is excessive daytime sleepiness, including episodes of irresistible sleepiness. It's usually combined with sudden muscle weakness. Um, Episodes of this can be described as like sleep attacks. It can happen kind of in the middle of something that it's like exercise that shouldn't be happening. Um, again, a healthcare provider is going to have to probably prescribe something to help with this type of disorder. So that's why, again, I'm saying it is very important if you are experiencing anything like this or think you might be having some type of sleep disorder, talk to your doctor because they will have to come up with a treatment plan with you. When to talk to your doctor. So some, some additional ones, we've talked about, you know, the excessive sleepiness during the day, but um, if you don't feel refreshed upon waking and you've slept, you know, seven hours the night before, if you feel like you have to take naps all the time to feel rested, 
Um, if you're having problems doing daily activities, if you're having problems um, falling asleep while driving, probably more so than the watching television and reading, because I don't know many people that don't fall asleep, you know, at some <laughs> point in time doing reading and television, but driving definitely if you're having those issues. Um, if someone's telling you that you're sleepwalking, so your son maybe needs to go to the, <laughs> go to the doctor, um, or someone's telling you that you're snoring or gasping loudly, um, that would be a sign to go. Or trouble with memory and concentration. So definitely some different things there to talk to your doctor about if you're struggling with sleep. Okay. So why is it important? Well, I've already mentioned it. It pretty much affects every system in our body. Um, it also has been a link to increase of chronic diseases, which I'm going to get into now. Um, so it's going to have problems with your physical body and then psychological side effects. So um, getting into the, the first one there, impaired immune system. So you're more likely to be sick, experience colds, you know, sickness a lot easier if you're not getting as much sleep or quality sleep. It can mess with your blood sugar control. Um, it can uh, make you uh, or decrease your ability to respond to insulin. So maybe a higher risk for getting diabetes down the line, increased risk for heart disease. So this one has a lot to do with just how your body is during sleep. So your heart is not working as hard when you're sleeping well, because your blood pressure is lowering, your heart rate is lowering. So if you're waking up a lot in the middle of the night or you're not getting enough sleep and cycling through those sleep stages, you're gonna be at an increased risk for things like high blood pressure, stroke, um, your arteries may become more inflexible because you're having high cholesterol problems. So um, down the line, it can lead to the heart disease problems. Obesity and weight gain. So this one has more to do with um, your hormones. So when we're not getting very good sleep or enough sleep, it's going to mess with your appetite and hunger control hormones, which in turn can lead to eating things that are not, you know, very nutrition. Oh my gosh, not very nutritious. So high fat foods, high sugar, salty foods. Um, you may be eating more often. Not only that, but if you're not sleeping well, you're probably tired and don't want to work out. So those are kind of the main two there that contribute to that. Um, I did find there was one research that found um, there's association between short sleep duration and excess body weight. It's reported in all age groups, but it's particularly pronounced in children, which was kind of scary to read about. I was like, oh. Um, so making sure your children are getting good sleep is also very important. So psychological side effects. This one, I mean, obviously we've all experienced uh, maybe a night of not very good sleep. We're more irritable, um, maybe more anxious, have more issues with um, depression. You're having memory problems. Maybe you're making mistakes at work. If it's really, really bad, hallucinations and psychiatric conditions. So obviously that is a whole nother ball game. Make sure you're talking to your doctor about those things, but um, definitely can affect pretty much every system that we have. Consequences of sleep loss. So this would be more like work. So presenteeism, you may not be as productive at work and our industry safety concerns arise, especially when we're caring for other people. Um, maybe you're irritable and stressed out. You're probably not a very nice person to be around when you're like that. Um, absenteeism, so maybe you're getting more sick more often because your immune system is not working properly. Um, and then medical issues. So we just saw that slide with everything on health risks, so it can lead to medical issues down the line. Okay, so shift work, any of you shift workers? Okay, I was gonna say at this time of day, I don't know if anyone would even be in here yet for shift work. Um, this is anyone that falls outside of the 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. I'll try not to spend a ton of time on this slide, but um, they do tend to get two to four hours less sleep than those who work days, um, especially true in hospital workers. So again, no surprise there. You may develop some type of disorders, so insomnia, um, excessive tiredness when you're at work. So the main thing for shift workers is sleep consistency. I know that's not easy for them to do because their days are different than everybody else, but if you're not working, trying to follow that same sleep schedule. 
light and noise exposure, so making sure your room is as dark as it possibly can be. Um, there was even a recommendation of wearing like headphones, you know, or shutting your phone off, anything that you can do to minimize the light and noise exposure. Consider a nap. So this would be down, down the line on the, some of these slides, it's kind of controversial to take a nap, but for someone that is a shift worker, it may be a good idea to do. Um, they can either do it right when they get home or go home, stay up a little bit and take a nap um, closer to when they're gonna be waking up. And then a relaxing activity before bed. So this is something that also will be recommended for people that are not on shift work, but anything that you can do to um, get your body ready for bed. I'm gonna get into it more once we get into like sleep environment. Tips for staying awake for shift workers. <laughs> um, caffeine in moderation. So um, I know a, a lot of people that I talk to that are doing third shift, I mean, they are relying on caffeine a lot because it's, again, your body's not your natural way to, to work. So um, get the blood moving. So if you can exercise before work, um, that will help. Taking a nap during work, if you can. Great idea. Yeah. <laughs> I know, maybe we all need that, <laughs> not just for shift workers. <laughs> yeah, I'll close my door and just take a nap every so often. Um, exercise caution. So this could be for someone, you know, I mentioned just the errors that can happen. So making sure that you're taking the time to double check things and doing things properly. Um, consider a post-nap work. So. Uh, I had a friend that worked third shift that would do this. She would get in her car and sleep for like 10, set a, you know, alarm for 10, 15 minutes later so she wouldn't be drowsy driving home. Um, I don't know if that would work for everyone, but it, it is something to consider. And then rotating shift workers. So I know that this is not all, you don't always have the luxury of knowing when your shift will change if you are on a rotating shift, but if you can sleep, adjust your sleep times prior to that change <clears throat> by a, like an hour or so. Um, then that will help not shock your body with changing to a completely different shift. And if it's not working, obviously talk with your supervisor because again, you want to make sure you're being safe and you feel like you are supported in, in that type of shift work. Okay, so let's get into sleep habits. So I mentioned earlier, a lot of times people will be on their phone at night right before bed because they can't sleep or they're reading on like a Kindle of some sort. Um, so light and ele electronic devices can kind of go together. TV, a lot of people like to have the TV on at night or they just, that's the only time they can watch a TV show that they've been watching. Um, so we learned earlier how that can mess with melatonin production. There are things out there, like my glasses that I have on uh, block blue light. So that is something you could look into. I didn't necessarily look into like the validity of those things, but I imagine they do work at some level because I got these from the eye doctor, so I'm assuming that they're probably okay. <laughs> um, caffeine intake, so again, this is a stimulant, so if you're drinking it too close to bedtime, it can make it really hard to, to go to sleep. Alcohol, um, again, it, and nicotine, both will have an effect on um, your body's processes, so Alcohol can affect, I think, how often you're in REM sleep. I can't remember, I should have wrote that down. Um, but a lot of times I've heard people saying they'll drink to help with going to bed at night because it relaxes them. It's not necessarily, it might help you fall asleep right away, but it won't help you have good sleep throughout the night. Eating before bed. Um, so this can go more towards, if you're eating right before you go to sleep, it can cause distress to your body. You know, you might need to go to the bathroom more often in the night. Um, or if it's like spicy food, it can obviously disrupt some things. So um, not saying you have to eat so many hours before bed, but just be mindful of that. Maybe you're not bothered by it at all, but for most people it can bother them. Um, and then naps during the day, that can throw off your, your rhythm throughout the day or your internal clocks. Again, some people can get by with taking a nap. If, if I took an, well, maybe now if I took a nap, I wouldn't be, I, so bad but before I had you know my baby taking a nap would have ruined me for the whole day so that's on you to kind of figure out trial and error on that one so effective sleep um, each thing here has kind of a lot so I'm gonna have my notes here in front of me again um, a pre bedtime routine this is um, going to go more into like winding down before bed at least 30 minutes if you can 
So this could be doing something that is like reading, um, low impact stretching, listening to music, relaxation exercises. Like for example, I use an app called Insight Timer that has like a sleep section and I will do like progressive muscle relaxation before bed sometimes or I'll listen to like, um, it's almost like a story. It's not a bedtime story that sounds, but it's a very <laughs> a visual type thing. Like you're imagining yourself walking. I know, right? Um, but it's gonna help get you in the in the mindset of winding down. Um, lower the lights. So again, the light, if you lower those, it will help with the production of melatonin. And um, disconnecting from devices. So if you can, try to limit that at least 30 minutes before bedtime. Creating a sleep-inducing bedroom. So make your place um, comfortable, relaxing. So this gets into making sure that you have quality bedding. So a mattress that isn't hurting your back, you know, pillows that are not hurting your neck, uh, sheets that feel good and comfortable that can help with regulating your body temperature. Some sheets can be very, very hot in the middle of the night. So quality bedding, mattress and pillow. Um, avoiding light disruption, so we kind of hit on that in the first one. So you could get blackout curtains, you could have an eye mask, uh, something along those lines. Keeping noise to a minimum. So this is where uh, like a fan or a white noise would come into play. Um, you could do headphones if you really wanted to, if you have no kids or no responsibilities other than yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, Find a temperature that works well for you um, and your partner if, you, if you know, you're trying to do that. So 65 degrees is what research supports is the best temperature. No, you're fine. Um, and then if you want things like lavender, so like a, some type of scent could help as well. Lavender is supposed to help with relaxing you. Um, so again, if you like to have aromas, that would be something to look into as well. Um, optimizing your sleep set schedule, so being consistent is the main one there. So staying as close to possible as waking up and going to bed at the same time, even on the weekends or when you're not working. Uh, budget time for sleep, so this is something where you would, what's your wake up time, count back seven to eight hours and set that as your bedtime. It doesn't always work. I try that, my phone alerts me like 45 minutes and I'm like, I don't even know why I have this on my phone anymore. <laughs> like, um, but something like that to help you get in the amount of hours that you wanna, wanna sleep. Um, being careful with naps. So again, this is up to you. There is research that shows that the best nap length is around 20 minutes. And then adjust your schedule gradually if you have to do the shift work. Um, fostering pro sleep habits during the day would be the next one there. So seeing the light of day, get outside. Um, you know, that's how our body knows it's time to go to sleep or wake up and go to sleep. So get outside. Um, you could even in the winter use a light therapy box. I've never used one, nor have I again looked up and researched how well those work, but that is something that you could consider during like the winter time when it's dark outside at 5 p.m. Find time to move, so exercise obviously is going to have benefits with um, your health in general, but sleep is another benefit that it has. Um, it can use energy throughout the day. It can um, help with body temperature. Um, don't do it right before bedtime though, unless that's the only time you have to do it, but intense exercise right before bedtime. Um, Caffeine intake, I've mentioned this a couple times, so just making sure you avoid it later in the day. Be mindful of alcohol. Don't eat too late. We've talked about these things. Don't smoke. Even secondhand smoke can cause problems for people, so just FYI on that. And then reserve your bed for sleep and sex only is the last one there for um, the last one, pro sleep habits during the day. If you can't sleep or you you're having trouble falling asleep or sleeping, waking up in the middle of the night, um, try those relaxation techniques I talked about. So you don't have to use the app that I was talking about. There's tons of apps out there available to you. Um, you don't even need an app. If you've done it enough, you can just do deep breathing on your own. 
pro progressive muscle relaxation is just like starting, you can either start at your head or your toes and you kind of just tense your body up. So once you do it a couple times, you'll know what to do without having to have a nap because I'm sitting here telling you don't be on your phone, but if you wake up, use a nap. Um, so <laughs> just keep your light level down on your phone in the middle of the night. <laughs> um, and then don't, this one was kind of counterintuitive to me, but don't stay in bed. Um, so if you've been in bed for around 20 minutes without being able to fall asleep or go back to sleep, get out of bed and go do something relaxing. To me, if I got out of bed, I would be awake. Um, so that's again up to you to see how, if you're having problems, you could try it out. You could be my guinea pig and tell me if it works or not. Um, but try to avoid checking the time. Um, you know, you could go read, do something that you know might help fall asleep. Um, and then being okay with experimenting with different methods. So it can be a trial and error process, which is super frustrating for some people, but you won't know until you, you try. Um, and you may have to try something multiple times before it will click. Um, or don't be afraid to say that's not working, go to the next thing. Um, and then keeping a sleep journal. So that way, um, if you are having issues, you know, you can maybe pinpoint what the problem might be but you could also take it into a doctor if you have problems that are continuing. So sleep aids. I'm not gonna get into these a ton, but there are prescription sleep aids out there. Um, they help with causing a sed, sed, oh my gosh, helping you sleep. <laughs> I can't say the word that I'm trying to say at the moment. Um, they just help you feel sleepy. And um, they're generally considered safe for short-term use, but not necessarily recommended for long-term use. So again, make sure you're consulting with your doctor before you introduce any of these things. Um, the over-the-counter stuff would be like NyQuil, Unisom, Tylenol, PM. They contain antihistamines. That's what's helped, helps feel sleepy. Even though they're used for allergies, it, it does produce a sleepiness effect on you. Again, it's not something that you would want to use long term. The supplements, so there are melatonin supplements available, lavender, chamomile tea. Um, supplements are not FDA regulated, so I can't necessarily say whether they work or not. Um, there's not a ton of research that's conclusive on these. Um, again, consult with your doctor before you start taking them, but there are some options out there that are considered safe to use. So um, if you have m more questions on that, like I said, I would recommend talking with your doctor. Okay, that's it. What questions do you have for me?